I call to order the May 22nd, 2023 O&J Roberts School of School Directors regular business meeting held on May 22 at 7 p.m. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and presentation of colors by the Navy Junior Reserves Officer Training Corps, followed by a moment of silence. Present colors. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. Please join us in a moment of silence as we reflect on those serving in the United States Armed Forces, both past and present, the elected leaders for the state of Pennsylvania, and elected leaders of our nation. We have much to be thankful for in our community. Color Guard Post Colors. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. My, this is a full room. It's very exciting. Um, let's see. We're moving on to the executive session announcement 3.1. The Board of School Directors met on the following dates in executive session to discuss items in one or more of the following areas legal, personnel, or real estate matters April 3, 2023, and May 22, 2023. Number four, the superintendent's report, Dr. Stout. Thank you, Mrs. Peterson. So I made the comment because most times when we recognize students for the sports seasons throughout the year, we don't have a whole lot here. So I made the comment to a board member earlier. I said, I don't think we'll have a whole lot tonight. Uh, and I walked in and Mrs. Peterson reminded me we're recognizing music students and they show up. So thank you for being here. And uh, this is a great night when we can recognize students for what they do. But I want to first start with uh, Hayden Streeter tonight for a Student uh, Government Executive Council report. Okay, so spring is a busy time of year, especially in the elementary schools. <clears throat> Recently, many of the schools enjoyed spring concerts and art shows. The district orchestra concert was enjoyed by all in attendance, and we look forward to tomorrow's evening, tomorrow evening's band concert. With PSSAs behind us, teachers are now completing end of year ass assessments with their classes. And then results from these assessments will not only aid teachers in completing final report cards, but the data generated will be beneficial to next year's teachers at the start of the year. The academic coaches are a valuable asset to our teachers, and just recently their talents were recognized as they were selected to present at Leaning Forward's 2023 annual conference in Washington, D.C. next May. Our coach's proposal to present was one of over 770 national submissions. Congratulations to Adria, Ashley, Danielle, Lindsay, and Lori. Finally, as we plan and prepare for end of the year events, including award ceremonies, sixth grade promotion events, and field days, we are also busy preparing for next year's kindergarten students to arrive. On May 10th, 78 eighth grade students were inducted into our middle school chapter of the National Junior Honor Society. On May 12th, our entire student body continued one of our favorite traditions as we lined the walkway between the middle school and the high school to cheer on our Special Olympic athletes and best buddies as they made their way to the high school stadium. Middle school, stu middle school students have also concluded their PSSA and Keystone exam testing and have put forth great effort. Middle school performing arts have been on display over the past couple of weeks as our students have participated in their respective band, chorus, and orchestra spring concerts. 
The middle school will welcome our sixth grade students to the building on May 31st and June 1st. Students will get a tour of the building and have the opportunity to participate in a QA and a session during their visit. Middle school award assemblies will take place on June 6th for both seventh and eighth grade students. And eighth grade students are looking forward to their farewell dance on June 2nd and their trip to Gettysburg on June 5th. Across the high school, you will find that our students are relieved to have SATs, advanced placement, international baccalaureate, and keystone exams nearly behind us for the year. Our students have worked incredibly hard throughout the month, and we are confident that they will see the payout from this work. There have been several celebrations each year over the past month and that have showcased the work of the talents of our students. We have hosted our annual art show, NJROTC promotion and change of command ceremony, farm day, the spring play, spring band, orchestra, and choral concerts, the OJR Film Festival, senior nights for all sports teams, and Special Olympics. Beyond the OJR campus, our coding crew competed at CodeQuest, our DECA students traveled to Orlando for the international competition, our jazz band performed with the Glenn Miller Orchestra, our Envirothon team took first place in Chester County, and we had an amazing junior and senior prom. We want to congratulate our girls lacrosse and girls softball teams on winning PAC championships, as well as several track and field students who won individual championships at the PAC meet. Finally, the high school staff would like to thank the PTSA for their generosity and support during Teacher Appreciation Week. We very much felt appreciated with all that you did to make us feel special and supported throughout the week. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hayden. Uh, would also like to welcome Josh Zhang, the incoming student government executive council president. Is Josh here tonight? Okay, Josh will be filling in next year, but a special thank you to Hayden uh, for your role as the class of 2023 student government executive council president. And on behalf of myself and the board, we'd like to wish you much success at Penn State next year. And we have a small gift for you. Thank you. Okay, next I want to introduce uh, Mr. Steve Kohler and he'll uh, talk about the valedictorian and salutatorian introductions. Good evening. Um, while I have the floor before I do valedictorian and salutatorian, I also uh, want to recognize because she skimmed over it, um, but Hayden is in her softball uniform this evening because she just came straight from a district playoff game. Um, and the softball team is fresh off their first PAC championship since 2009. So amazing leadership from Hayden and our seniors and congratulations, Hayden. All right, so tonight is one of the really, really fun nights uh, as the high school principal. I'm very excited that we've got a full room um, and a number of our high school students uh, behind us. And we're gonna start with a number of celebrations tonight. Um, to start with that, we're going to start with valedictorian and salutatorian. Um, this is something that, that has been done at least in the three years that I've been here, um, but something that I've never seen anywhere else. And what we do this evening um, is we give our valedictorian an opportunity to come up and speak um, on behalf of a teacher that had a significant influence on them. Um, and then that teacher gets to come up and speak on behalf of the student. Uh, and it's, there's a really kind of nice reciprocal pairing there, and I wish that we could kind of expand this out further. Um, and then once we've done that, we're going to do that with our salutatorian as well. So our valedictorian is Eliana Crew. Um, she will be heading to the University of Pittsburgh next year to study engineering. Um, and I'd like to now invite Eliana up to the podium. Good evening. <clears throat> when I was informed of the opportunity to recognize a teacher tonight, my mind gravitated towards Profe Andres rather quickly. Two years ago, I will admit, I was apprehensive about taking her class after hearing tales of its difficulty, but I also figured there would be no better way to improve my Spanish. And through her class, I learned there really was no better way. Though her tests were sometimes intense and answering questions sometimes intimidating, Spanish 4 was the class in which I learned and more importantly retained the most information out of any course I've taken in high school. I can also attest that this is because of Profe. Her exceptional teaching style made the challenging content engaging, and she fostered a classroom environment that celebrated enthusiasm for language learning. I left her class with not only a larger vocabulary, a deeper understanding of grammar, and knowledge of how to put adequate emphasis on the right syllable, <laughs> but also with a newfound confidence in my abilities. 
and her commendable skills extend beyond what she brought from the syllabus to our 50-minute daily classes, as Profe is also an inspirational person to be around. I am motivated by her guidance and support just as much as I am driven by her strength and passion. She truly deserves recognition tonight and every other day, and I will greatly miss her in the coming years. Thank you. Wow. Um, I'm <laughs> speechless. Uh, I had a, uh, when I got invited to come tonight, um, truly an honor and overwhelmed, and I really had to think long and hard of how to put into words um, a special person Eliana is. So um, I'm going to give it a whirl here. But she is kind, caring, creative, and compassionate. She may be dropping by with a birthday card and my favorite cookies or a bouquet of flowers or a special thank you note of appreciation or a question about some Spanish grammar. She always brightens my day. Eliana is an exceptional student whose critical thinking skills and work ethic truly distinguish her as one of the top students I have had the honor and pleasure to teach in my 30 years as an educator. She is a true scholar in every sense of the word, excelling in all disciplines of study but not just with respect to grades. She has a passion for learning and the ability to see and process tasks through an interdisciplinary lens. She carries herself with poise, demonstrates humility, and makes the world a better place. She shows empathy, gives of her time, and shares of her talents, whether it's working with underprivileged youth in Central America, or lending a hand to teachers like myself, or volunteering in the community. It is an honor to stand here tonight and to be invited by this remarkable young lady. Enhorabuena, Eliana, por todo lo que has logrado y sé que vas a cambiar el mundo. All right, and next up, I would like to invite our salutatorian. Um, our salutatorian this year is Kate Bacalio. Um, much like Eliana, despite all of the wonderful universities we have in the Philadelphia area, she is heading west um, and heading to Pittsburgh as well. She'll be going to Carnegie Mellon University to study business administration and computer science. Kate, do you want to come up to the podium? Good evening, everyone. When I first heard that I had to pick a teacher to recognize today, Mrs. Berla immediately jumped into my mind. During my high school journey, I've had the privilege of having her as my teacher for two years in my IB core class. While this may sound challenging, it is anything but. As part of the IB program, all IB candidates must take a course that follows a specific curriculum focusing on self-growth, understanding, and self-understanding, and teamwork. <laughs> This class has been a haven for me to relax and talk about subjects many other teachers would have deemed taboo. Mrs. Brilla has done an outstanding job of making me and all other IB students feel safe and comfortable. We've never had difficulty talking to her about both school and personal issues, and she always has a solution. She never forces students into conforming or meeting harsh criteria. Rather, she sees each student as an individual with different qualities and adapts her teaching method accordingly. I see Mrs. Brella as more than an amazing teacher, but also a fantastic person. She goes above and beyond her teaching duties to create personal connections with her students and make all feel comfortable, regardless of class level or even language. Just for context, she has one math class with students that speak English, Portuguese, and Spanish. I could not think of a more selfless individual to go through the difficulties of teaching through a language barrier and still succeed. So I want to thank you, Mrs. Brella, for shaping these last few years of my high school journey. You have brought me so much enjoyment and calm. As a salutatorian, I've had to write many essays and speeches, and none have come to me as easier than this one. Mrs. Brilla, I will never forget what you have taught me and done for me. Thank you. I know we are here to honor Kate Bacala for earning the title salutatorian, and in no way do I want to take away from the hard work that she put forth in her academics. It truly is quite an accomplishment, but 
I fu fully believe if all we focus on is Kate and her unbelievable GPA, then we're neglecting the other title that Kate has earned. Of course, I'll explain. All educators are often asked to give recommendations based on more than just their grades. Instead, we're asked to focus on the characteristics of the student themselves. There's actually a column with the title, top 1% of students I have encountered. Now this, this title is something where we focus on the maturity, internal motivation, persistence, influence on others surrounding the student, leadership and advocacy skills, just to name some of the top ones. Okay, Bacalo, you, my K-pop loving, IB thinking, intellectual student belong in that column with that title and all you do and all of who you are. When you advocate, it's not just for what you see as right, but you advocate for the right thing for others when others are too nervous to speak. And when you influence others around you, it's not through a single conversation in a classroom, but through a year-long school-wide diversity program that you initiated, created, and taught. And maturity, Kate, you hold yourself to standards that I still strive to hold for myself. Back in 2018, my husband, an eighth grade OJR teacher, came home and said, wait until you meet Kate Bacallo. She will be an IB for sure, and she will make a difference. Well, in 2021, I finally had the pleasure not only to meet Kate as she walked into my IB classroom, but watch her grow over the next two years. And she was absolutely worth the wait. And you, Kate, are in the top 1% of the students I have ever encountered. It's a complete honor to be here tonight to speak on your behalf. Thank you. Congratulations and uh, well done on those speeches. Mr. Kohler, I think you have a few more uh, recognitions tonight. So next we're going to go into our students that have won various uh, music awards throughout the spring, and then we'll move into our students who um, will be serving in the military after graduation. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Stout. So um, you and uh, Mrs. Peterson alluded to this, but um, sitting behind me, I think, is the biggest team that we've ever had show up for a board meeting before, um, which I'm very excited about. So behind me here is our indoor percussion ensemble, um, who are the Mid-Atlantic Percussion Society champions. Um, so this was held on Saturday, May 15th at Coatesville High School. After a four month long season with unprecedented success, our team earned their highest score of the season and finished in first place out of 22 ensembles, marking the first MAPS championship in team history. So we wanna first offer congratulations to all of our students, instructors, parents, um, but particularly our head percussion instructor, uh, Mr. Daniel Herbine, who's also an OJR graduate. Uh, and at this time, I would like to invite him up to the podium to help recognize his team. Thank you, Mr. Kohler. Uh, I apologize for my appearance. I did not plan on being here this evening. And uh, thus, I'm wearing a button down that was in the back of my car and gym shorts. So <laughs> ignore that. Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, we had a great introduction for how our season went. I've been part of the program uh, as the director for seven years now. And uh, you know, as was mentioned, this is the best season we've ever had in our history. We got third place last year and, and took another step up and, and won the whole thing this year. So it's pretty amazing, and these kids work unbelievably hard for several months on end and uh, really, really proud of this group behind me. And I know all of them couldn't be here tonight, but we have a pretty good handful. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to hand out some individual certificates. So if you guys don't mind coming up, I can present them to you as such. So uh, Aaron Schoenrock. Adam Mama. Okay. Alec Bittler. Oh, there he is. Alex Roach, who could not be here. Jake. Andrew Blackledge. Andrew 
Anya Olson. Austin Spranger. Brenna Horger. Brooks Grant. Camden Jones could not be here. Cecilia Trainer. Charlotte McQuillan. Chris Kirk. Elliot Berry. Jack Bruton. Jake Roach. Kaylin Grosser. Kai Ludwig. Kira Meyer. Kira Young. Not here. Logan Vernon. Not here. Mackenzie Keith. Not here. We're going quick. Max Ackerman, also not here. Mia Morrow. Reagan Morrison. Not here. Rebecca Shane. Sam Reynolds. We're almost done, I promise. Travis Dewey. Tyler Roth. Tyson Gertie. Will Herb. And that is that. There we go. Make quick work of it. Thank you, everybody. All right, we're going to keep moving forward with recognition of uh, our students within the musical realm um, who have had success this year. So the Pennsylvania Music Education Association um, has uh, a number of different levels of recognition, similar to, I guess, what you would find in a sports level um, with all league. Um, so there is a district level, there's regional level, and then there is all state. And so we are going to start with the band this evening. Um, so when I call your name, um, if you want to come on up to, to the front, um, and I've got certificates for you as well um, that I'll be presenting on behalf of Mr. Mengel this evening. So we had five students make it to the district band level. Jake Ambrosio, Jen Felice, Reagan Morrison, Matthew Mulholland, and Austin Spranger. These guys have been through this a couple of times now at different events, so they kind of know how this works. Um, the next level up from district band is regional band, um, and Matthew and Austin both qualified for regional band. Congratulations. <laughs> Austin, don't go away. Uh, and then lastly, uh, after the regional level, there is also All-State Band in this year. Austin uh, represented us at the All-State Band. So congratulations, Austin. All right, next up for choir, um, and I'll be presenting on behalf of Mrs. Steinmacher um, this evening. Uh, we had six students who made it to the district chorus level. Morgan Frederick, Sadie Frederick, Annalise Martin, Thomas Peterson, Laura Reed, Elena Ruggieri, and Austin Spranger. So after the district chorus level comes the regional chorus level, and making it to regional chorus were Sadie Frederick, Annalise Martin, and Thomas Peterson. And then we had one representative at all state chorus this year, and that was Sadie Frederick. <laughs> uh, 
And then lastly, our orchestra students on behalf of Mrs. Del Pino, we had two students make it to the district orchestra level, Abigail Di Marino and Josiah Mendenhall. And while Josiah is up here advancing both uh, out of district orchestra to the regional level, we're also Abigail Di Marino and Josiah Mendenhall. And Dr. Stout, should I continue to hold the floor? Keep going, Mr. Kohler. All right. <laughs> Um, and then lastly this evening, uh, we want to recognize, we have several students who have chosen to serve in the military after graduation, and we want to recognize those students. I know at least one of those uh, students is here tonight. So uh, if you are here, please again come up to the front and join me. Um, first is Anthony Gargano, who will be going to the United States Navy. Uh, Tristan Goodman, also to the United States Navy. James Lafferty to the United States National Guard through Westchester University. Sean Reitenauer to the United States Army. Kareem Saban to the United States National Guard through Westchester University. And Kyle Sayers to the United States or doing United States Army ROTC at Widener University. And I think that is all for the high school for tonight. So thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity and for being able to recognize our high school students this evening. Next, we have the uh, Citadel Heart of Learning uh, nominee. So I'd like to recognize Krista Troutman, uh, OJR's 2003 Citadel Heart of Learning finalist. And I saw Krista in the back. So Krista, I'm just going to read a little something here, and then I'd like you to come up, and I will give you a certificate. So the Citadel Heart of Learning Award is a nationally recognized program through Citadel Banking and the Chester County Intermediate Unit. The award is designed to honor and thank Chester County's teachers while raising awareness of the impact on students, families, and the entire community. On April 13th, uh, Citadel representatives awarded French Creek teacher Mrs. Chris, Mrs. Christina Troutman the Citadel Heart of Learning Finals Award for Owen J. Roberts School District. Mrs. Troutman received the $500 award to purchase supplies or other items for her classroom. I was very fortunate. We had several hundred teachers recommended for our district. Uh, by students, by parents, and Mrs. Troutman was the nomination. I was fortunate to be at French Creek when they surprised her. She had no idea uh, that she was getting this award, and it was awesome. The kids loved it, the staff loved it, and it's very well deserved. So Krista, come on up. Now we have the principals that will be coming to the mic to recognize uh, their PTA and PTO presidents. And I believe we're starting tonight with um, East Coventry Elementary, Dr. Oswald. Good evening, everyone. I have the distinct uh, pleasure of introducing uh, to you Brittany Ehrenzeller, who was our PTO president. And just brief uh, remark about Brittany. Brittany uh, did an amazing job this year working along the other officers to really transform 
um, the uh, East Coventry PTA to a PTO. And that doesn't sound like much, but there was a lot of work behind the scenes uh, to do that, which will have an amazing impact on um, our students and staff and what they're able to do to support for years to come. So Brittany Aronzella, if you can come up, please. And I believe I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my colleague, Dr. Smith from East Vincent. Dr. Smith. Good evening, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome and uh, honor Jen Barner as our PTA president for the last two years. She's actually started to make her way for the OM competition, so she's not here tonight. Um, but it's been my pleasure for the last two years working side by side with her and the entire board um, and acclimating into the East Vincent community. And without her, I think our PTA board would not have been as successful. So um, please join me in thanking Mrs. Barner for her hard work the last two years. Thank you. Good evening. I don't believe that Mrs. Delaney is with us this evening, but I'd like to take a moment on behalf of the Board of School Directors to thank Mrs. Delaney for her tireless efforts as our French Creek PTA president. I can't think of a time when Mrs. Delaney wasn't at school several times a week volunteering or planning exciting events. During her two-year term in office, Mrs. Delaney brought fresh ideas to the board, such as the Apex Fun Run and new fundraising ideas. Her commitment and hard work on behalf of our students and staff is extremely appreciated. Thank you. Good evening. Tireless, family-centered, effortless leader. Those are the words I would use to describe the PTO president, Amy Lignelli from North Coventry. I had the pleasure of meeting Amy early on, prior to me even beginning officially as the principal at North Coventry. She worked to help ensure that all events that our PTO held were accessible to all families, whether they be free or at a low cost, so that we could attract students and families to make them feel comfortable at North Coventry. Just a few hours ago, Amy was out with a team of volunteers helping to chalk the walk to help welcome our incoming kindergartners tomorrow for our kindergarten roundup. Everything that Amy has done with her team of volunteers has been family focused and for the students and community of North Coventry. I have the privilege of getting to work with her again next year and I'm thrilled to continue that partnership. Amy. All right, good evening. I'm not sure if Ashley Jakubic is here tonight. Um, I haven't seen her yet, uh, but if she's not, hopefully she can hear these, uh, these kind words going her way. So I got an opportunity to, to join the West Vincent community this year, started on August 18th. I think August 19th, I heard from Ashley in the PTA and they asked, how do you feel about getting in a dunk tank? Um, which was uh, basically my initiation to West Vincent through the back to school bash. Um, and what I found is that there isn't a group that does a better job at bringing out the community uh, for fun events, making West Vincent truly feel uh, like a family. So, uh, you know, on behalf of everybody that has served through the PTA, it is a distinct pleasure to be able to honor Ashley Jakubic and all of the work that she put in as PTA president this year. So thank you to Ashley and the West Vincent PTA. Good evening, everyone. My pleasure this evening to recognize Leslie Prophet as our middle school PTA president. I saw Leslie is here. Leslie is an amazing individual. She, I've never seen anybody with a motor like Leslie. She has juggles so many things in the air at one time.
her family obligations. There were times, I'm sure, throughout the year that we've had meetings uh, from cars, uh, but we had the meetings nonetheless because she knew it was necessary to do so. Uh, there was not a month that went by where there wasn't some activity that was being planned for our students or for our staff. Uh, and really the goal was to do something every month of the school year, and sometimes multiple times a month. Uh, I am most pleased that Leslie will be returning for a second year as our middle school PTA president. We don't get that very often. Things turn over rather quickly with our families and our parents and our volunteers. So I'm very happy that Leslie will be back as our president next year. So Leslie, if you would come forward. All right, and while we're recognizing presidents this evening, I'm gonna cheat a little bit um, because I've got two wonderful representatives of our high school PTSA sitting next to each other tonight. Uh, I don't know if this is by design or not, but uh, Denise, since you're here, I'm gonna roll you into this. Um, so Kim Acosta is our president, um, and Denise Grant has been one of our board members over the course of the last two years as well, um, at a time of great transition for the high school PT PTSA. Um, I think you guys know at the high school level, doing a PTSA is hard because there's all these other wonderful things that are going on and parents start to get connected specific to things that their individual children are doing. Um, but uh, Kim, through Kim's leadership, um, has really helped us to continue to drive forward um, you know one of the big things that they do is the the prom fashion show which raises a ton of money and this year they then turned around a $7,500 donation back to the prom allowing us to reduce ticket prices by $15 per student this year um, and that's just one of the the many wonderful things that they've done uh, unfortunately at the high school level um, students graduate um, and Kim has had three students come through the high school the I'm sorry four students come through the high school the last of which is graduating this year and from I think the very start last year I see Kim pump her fists. Um, from the start last year, she told us that um, when Ian graduates, then she graduates as well, although she has promised uh, to be on retainer as a special consultant. So I appreciate that, Kim. Um, and Kim, why don't you come on up? Okay, thank you to all the PTA and PTO presidents for your time and service. It, it is greatly appreciated by the district. So we have three retirees on tonight's agenda. Uh, none of the three are here, but I will read uh, a short statement about each one of them. So the first one is Kathy, Catherine Gundrum from the middle school. Kathy has been with the district for 13 years, serving as a paraprofessional in the middle school as well as North Coventry. Kathy is always willing to lend a hand wherever needed. She loves the bonds that she was able to form with our colleagues as well as with the students with whom she works. Next, we have uh, Ken Rosecki. Ken has been with the district for 23 years as an HVAC tech in the maintenance department. In his off time, he is an avid golfer and Phillies fan. He has also spent many years coaching Little League and is a practicing musician. In his retirement, Ken is looking forward to spending time on his home kitchen renovation and more time out on the golf course. And last, we have Russell Valentine. Uh, Russell, or Mr. Rusty, as everyone knows him, has faithfully served the district for 28 years in the maintenance department. For the last 18 years, he worked at East Coventry Elementary School. Prior to that, he worked in district maintenance and at East Vincent. Mr. Rusty has always had a smile on his face and was always willing to help out in any way possible. The entire East Coventry community will miss him and wish him the best as he gets a chance to spend more time tinkering with old cars and enjoying time with his family, including his granddaughter. So can we give a round of applause for our three retirees? As you can see tonight, it's getting to be that time of the year. So we have a lot of things going on in the district, but there are many upcoming events in the next few weeks for seniors including the Senior Breakfast, Yearbook Dedication, the Senior Sports Awards Banquet, the Senior Awards Assembly, and the culminating event, Graduation, which is scheduled for Friday, June 9th. Graduation is scheduled at 6.30 p.m. 
I'm going to say it even though I don't want to, with a rain date of Saturday, June 10th at 9.30. So we're hopeful that we have an evening like tonight uh, on June 9th. So uh, very much looking forward to these upcoming events. And then lastly, there are two calendar updates to be noted. The district will be closed on Monday, May 29th for Memorial Day, and an additional school board working session has been scheduled for June 5th at 6 p.m. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Stout. We're going to take uh, about a five minute recess so that um, our students in the room can uh, uh, come out in the hallway and, and we can spend a few minutes with you and you can uh, continue on to studying. I know some of you still have another Keystone Day tomorrow. Um, I'm looking at you, Tom Peterson. Um, so we will <laughs> uh, have a few minute recess to spend some time with our students that um, we had the pleasure of meeting here tonight and we will be back in about five minutes or so. Thank you. We are coming back in session. You know, there are a lot of seats open in the front now. I'm just saying. Join us. OK, so we are moving on to agenda item 5.1, which is the public con comment on agenda items. There are two opportunities for public comment. The first section is for information, proposals, and statements from individuals or delegations pertaining to items on the agenda that will be voted on tonight. Speakers are to indicate your name, township of residence, and the items on the agenda to which your comments are addressed. Speakers will be limited to not more than three minutes. Please understand that this is not a time for dialogue with the board. Rather, the board will listen to all comments and consider them in future deliberations. The second section will be at the end of the meeting and is for residents to speak on any item. If you have a question for the school board, please email all board of school directors at schoolboardmembers at ojrsd.net and you will receive a written response. For anyone who would like to make a comment online or on Zoom, please use the raise hand function. When it is your turn to speak, please state your name and township of residence. Uh, Heather McCrary, um, East Coventry. I'm going to speak to the first item is number 13, new business and approval ratification of professional services and maintenance of agreement as presented. And I'm looking at eight different contracts on there, including the G&L contract addendum. And first, there was no addendum attached to the agenda. And I wasn't clear on why that wasn't done. I had to ask you guys a couple times to put the video up because I couldn't hear it when I was actually in the room. So then when I went back to listen, I did understand that there was already about over $300,000, $350,000 in, apparently in the district that could cover the raise that was talked about for the drivers. So I'm trying to understand though then why the raise is only going in starting in May and not at least retroactive to January. All year, you guys like talked about problems with the bus drivers, and I don't understand why you guys don't do that and make it retroactive, at least to January. Those bus drivers were loyal. They stayed here. There were short drivers. They've done double, triple runs, sitting kids three to a seat. You guys should do the right thing by them. The second item um, is 1315, approval of the government funds budget. And I think that when you guys either vote yes or vote no, you need to say the reason. There's a lot of academic issues that are lacking. The math teacher's gone with the COVID money. Um, there's my usual comment about no top academic IB or AP. And also the other issue that I bring up again is when I wrote to you guys and spoke on the pay to play and the activities fee. By my estimation, based on what other schools charge, that could actually be from 1.5 to over $2 million income revenue to this district, and you guys have not even considered it. So the thing of it is, is that it doesn't take from people's pockets and they can't afford to pay it. Free and reduced lunch covers people that can't, but it actually allows more activities to be added into this district, especially if we're gonna talk about adding more athletic teams at the next meeting after the budget is already put into place. I really think you guys need to ask some questions and justify either your yes or no vote. Thank you. We have one hand raised. Carrie Culp, 
Uh, please unmute yourself and state your full name and township of residence. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carrie Culp and I live in East Coventry Township. I would like to comment on agenda item 17, future meeting dates. I'm asking the board to please reconsider the changes to future meetings that were announced at the last working session, which were a change in the start time of all meetings to 6 p.m. and removal of public commentary optionality for virtual attendance via Zoom. These changes represent obstacles which will result in many district residents no longer being able to attend meetings at all. Others will no longer have the option to make public commentary due to the fact that the only attendance option that works for them is the virtual one. This decision disenfranchises residents and seems to run counter to the district's very own equity policy. Specifically, I had questions on the meeting schedule that has, post, has been posted under agenda item 17. It seems that the June 26th school board meeting has a scheduled location of the middle school LGI, but also indicates that it will still be offered via Zoom. I'm looking for clarification as to how that will be facilitated, as it is my understanding, based on the discussion at the last meeting, that the issue with continuation of Zoom capabilities at locations other than the high school LGI is due to lack of access to microphones. Additionally, all of the meetings listed for next academic year re reflect the changed start time of 6 p.m., but all still list the location of the meeting as the high school LGI. So again, I'm wondering why in that case, Zoom is not going to be an option as the high school LGI has the necessary microphones to utilize Zoom. I would also like to express concern regarding the rotating meeting locations for working sessions, as it has been my experience having attended many of these meetings in the past that in-person attendees often struggled to be able to hear the board discussion or see the projected presentations. And finally, regardless of where or whether the whether the board decides to move forward with these changes, I'm wondering why these meetings, those meetings, which will still be held in the high school LGI, specifically all of the general school board meetings, would not still be able to be offered virtually via Zoom, which would also allow for public commentary. My last request would be that all of the board members who were not, who did not have the opportunity to weigh into this discussion at the last meeting would be so kind as to make their positions on this decision known so that the public can understand where all of their elected officials stand on this issue. Thank you. That's all the hands we have raised at this time. Thank you. We are moving on to agenda item six. Board committee reports. Uh, sorry, a working session was held on May 8, 2023 at 6 p.m. The following committees met at this time. Curriculum and special education, finance, building and grounds, and personnel. Agenda item 6.2, Chester County Intermediate Unit, Mrs. Munson. So the Chester County Intermediate Unit met on May 17th at the Coatesville Child and Career Development Center. And um, this, we have super, super exciting news. Um, the the uh, CCIU is going ahead with a purchase of a new property. It's in the Great Valley School District. It's near the intersection of 401 and 202. And we're hoping that this new building will be able to expand the CCIU's offerings of programs. Um, I believe it's being slated to hopefully be built in time for the 2025-26 school year, um, and I will continue to up the, update the board as we hear more about that, because that's, you know, close to our section. There are also plans to expand into the Fred S. Engel Middle School in the Avon Grove District, but that's so far in the south of the um, county that I don't think that's really going to have a real effect on the programs that our particular student population are interested in attending. But um, very excited about that. I think it's a good move given the uh, restrictions and the wait lists that so many programs have. And um, I think it'll offer a lot of opportunities to students in our area. Uh, the next meeting for the CCIU will be on June 21st at 7.30 p.m. in the CCIU Educational Center. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Munson. 6.3 Curriculum and Special Education Committee, Mrs. Sabo. The curriculum committee met on May 8th working session. There were two items on the agenda. The elementary STEAM teachers and Dr. Lehman provided an update from the first year of the new STEAM course. The teachers had additional professional development from outside agencies, conference attendants, and the Chester County Intermediate Unit. The group prepared lessons for all five schools for each grade level and piloted several of the lessons for the two-year course. 
The board receives summary information for two textbooks and those titles are currently on the agenda for this evening. Although there's no committee meeting currently scheduled for summer, the curriculum department will be running Jumpstart, Kinder Camp, and Recreational and Academic Camp programs. Families can still register students for summer programming in school pay. In addition, new teacher induction has been planned for the week of August 14th and professional development for all teachers begins on August 22nd. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mrs. Sabo. Finance, Building and Grounds Committee, Mr. Harmanos. Good evening. Um, tonight's a, a big night for the Finance, Building and Grounds Committee. Uh, we have been working very hard since November on uh, the 2023-2024 budget. And tonight's agenda includes many items that are related to the bu budget uh, listed from 1313 through 1324. Uh, to date, we've had six uh, board working sessions and um, uh, also have had three uh, standalone finance committee sessions uh, to discuss the uh, budget. So that's a total of nine public meetings where we've discussed budgetary items. Uh, so um, without going through the entire list, I think the biggest one we have is uh, item 13.15, and that's the uh, uh, where we'll be asking for approval of the proposed budget for next year. Thank you, Mr. Harmanos. Legislative and Policy Committee, Mrs. Munson. Right, so the Legislative and Policy Committee met on 4-3-2023, that would be, let's see, April 3rd, um, and discussed the items that are now on section 13.7 uh, for second reading on tonight's agenda. Uh, these changes were from Act 55 of to, in 2022, the Omnibus School Code Bill was signed into law and it made several am amendments to section 1327.1 of the PA School Code. It addresses home education, typically referred to as homeschool programs. The new law requires school districts to permit children enrolled in the home education programs to participate in the district co-curricular activities and academic courses and in career and tech Technical edu education programs on the same basis as other students enrolled in the districts. These provisions will begin in the 2023 to 24 school year. So first on policy 137, the home educational programs policy, it was revised to reflect the need for additional record keeping based on the new participation provisions for home education students. Um, we added additional language to clarify requirements for certifications that adults living in the home have not been um, certifications that adults living in the home have not been convicted of criminal offenses enumerated in school code and for programs determined to be out of compliance and transfer allowers. Then policy 13, I'm sorry, 137.1, extracurricular participation by home education students. The policy was updated for consistency with the new policy guides addressing participation in co-curricular activities and academic courses and career and te technical education programs. Language is added about posting of information regarding extracurricular activities, eligib eligibility criteria, and dates and times of physical examinations of medical tests in accordance with the school code provisions. For policy 137.2, new policy, this is participation in co-curricular activities and academic courses by home education students. This new policy states that students attending home education programs shall be given an equal opportunity to compete for positions and participate in district co-curricular activities and academic courses in accordance with board policy on the same basis as other students enrolled full-time in the district. It outlines the conditions for eligibility, participation, and addresses transportation. Policy 137.3 is also a new policy. Participation in career and technical education programs by home education students. Um, this one states that attending home education programs shall be given an equal opportunity to apply for participation in career and technical education programs in accordance with board policy on the same basis as other students enrolled full-time in the district. It outlines the conditions for eligibility, participation, and addresses transportation. And policy 227, controlled substances paraphernalia, previous title was drug, alcohol, and mood altering substance policy. Additional language was added for students seeking help, guidelines on reporting incidents involving possession, use, or sale of controlled substances, and anabolic steroids. 
Information about off-campus activities was also added with a reference to policy 218, student discipline, which is where school administrators should be directed when considering consequences for a student's conduct that occurred off school property or during non-school hours. This concludes our report. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Munson. 6.6 .6 personnel committee, Dr. Rotoli. Yes, the board will vote on the confidential employee agreement and the Teamsters addendum. The board and administration believe each to be important in recruiting and retaining quality employees for the OJR school district. The personnel committee will be meeting again next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rotoli. Agenda item seven, routine, uh, recommend routine matters consent items. May I have a motion 7.1 to approve recommended routine matters consent items 7.2 through 7.8. So moved. Uh, Mrs. Sabo, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Harmanos, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Eight, recommended routine matters. May I have a motion to acknowledge receipt of donations, contributions, and gifts? The, the receipt, donations, contributions, and gifts are uh, to the district, the Benevity Community Impact Fund, $1.88. OJR Friends of the Arts, $500 to Art Camp Scholarships. At the high school, we received from the Education Foundation $598 for iPads for adaptive PE classes and $1,159 for wireless microphone speakers for the band. At the middle school, the Education Foundation donated $500 towards symbols for the band. At East Coventry Elementary School, the East Coventry PTO provided $850 toward the field trip to Weaver's Orchard, $600 towards Science Explorers at East Coventry, $400 towards History Hunters at East Coventry, and $13,000 toward the purchase of guided readers. East Coventry parent Anthony Cleveland donated a canopy tent with the approximate value of $110. At East Vincent Elementary School, the East Vincent PTA donated $750 for the field trip to Reading Public Museum. At North Coventry, the North Coventry PTO donated $1,079 toward a field trip to Da Vinci Science Center and $1,053 toward the field trip to Elmwood Park Zoo. At West Vincent Elementary School, the West Vincent PTA donated $397.22 toward the field trip to Warwick Park and $1,050 toward field trips to Elmwood Park Zoo and Paradise Farms. Do I have a motion to accept those, or to acknowledge those gifts as presented? So moved. Second. Mr. Harmonos and Mrs. Sabo, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Agenda item nine, 9.1, a motion to approve routine matters, consent items 9.2 through 9.5. Can I have a motion? to approve the following routine matters, which are items 9.2 through 9.5 as action consent items. A motion. Mr. Dockerty, do I have a second? Second. Mrs. DiMarino, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Passes. Eh. Uh, agenda item 10, board discussion. I just had some comments about what I wanted to make about the budget and the proposal. First, I wanted just to say that um, this is the first year I've been on the Finance Committee and I was, Mrs. Crumbrine has done an outstanding job in um, helping us to uh, understand all the budget presentations and she basically has put together a budget that she feels is the will of the board. And I've been appreciative of that. Um, but you know, there, are, there is um, definitely some discord in me because even though the tax increase is small, you know the budget is increasing by you know several million dollars over last year but that is being offset by more revenue and um i just personally have had lots of talks with families people who own family businesses in our community don't have the luxury of just uh, um, increasing revenue and you know we've had crazy inflation and high gas prices from like three years now so um while we can ask our taxpayers to fund that shortfall even though it's small um, I am troubled by that a bit, and I know that we could, as a district, do what other families would do and maybe um, delay some of our large expenditures 
in our capital budget in order to um, not raise taxes or, or reduce even further what we raise basically would require a policy change and not putting the full mill of um, capital expenses into our general fund budget. I don't know if anyone has any um, opinion on that or I know that talking to Mrs. Crum Ryan, this is something that the board has done. Not uh, 2020 was waived entirely, which I would not, re I, I'm not asking for that, but um, there has been historically done that the board has gone to a half of a mill instead of a full mill to just help those families who basically every year as when the budget increases, although I do appreciate the work of making it low and slow with increases, I do know that there are families every year that have to decide whether or not a for sale sign is what they need to do because of just, you know, property taxes are high here. And it's because of our lack of commercial, you know, um, contributions and all that I understand completely. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out to the board that we could consider changing that even at this late date and um, that policy and not uh, transferring an entire mill into the general into the capital reserve budget or capital expenses whatever it's called sorry <laughs> I'm new on the finance committee um, and I just want to throw that out and see if there's any interest in talking about that with any of the board members um, so I think you know um, this particular budget as um, you mentioned Mrs. DiMarino, um, is reflective of a tremendous amount of work done by Mrs. Kermine and her staff in the business office as well as uh, department heads throughout the district who put in tremendous amount of work to create and, and present a budget to us that um, continues to meet the needs of our district without um, uh, an exorbitant increase. And while any increase is more than I think any of us, you know, everyone sitting on this side of the table, with the exception of Mr. Subers, is also a resident, and this affects every single one of us yes, here at this table as well. Um, but we have a fiduciary responsibility as a board to this community to make the best financial decisions that are in, in the interest of our entire community. And from my perspective, delaying savings, delaying capital projects is not in the best interest of our community. It's not in the best long-term interest of our students. And uh, a strong student education, a strongly educated group of young people only makes our community stronger. And while um, I am proud of the, um, while none of us wants to raise taxes, I am proud of this number and the work that went into this number. I am proud that we are less than half of the current inflation rate for the first quarter of 2023. I am proud that we are less than half of the Act One index that allow, the state of Pennsylvania allows us to raise taxes by, and we are under the 10-year average for what we have raised taxes in this district before. All of those things, to me, are an indicator of the rightness of this budget at this time. I'm not comfortable taking a loan against our future and the things that we want to accomplish as a district. When we talk about capital projects, we talk about things like creating a middle school that is right-sized for our student body. We talk about creating an athletic program and athletic fields uh, and facilities that are modern and worthy of our athletes. We talk about, you and I have talked about multiple times performing arts venues and how best to support our student musicians because we know the arts are important to student education. So while it's easy to say, I don't want to say easy, I don't want to put that in, <laughs> assign that to it, but while it, you know, the discussion may come around as to delaying um, uh, deposits into this capital reserve, all we are doing is taking a loan against our future and our children's and our community's future. Because at some point we will have to move forward on those things. And if we haven't adequately saved, like our community has adequately saved, we will have to take physical loans to do those things. And I don't think that's in the best interest of this school district long term or this community. So I'm happy to hear what, what other people on the board think. From my perspective, that is not something at this time that I think is necessary for this budget process. I appreciate your comments. I'll, just one thing I just wanted to say is, um, all your all that is noted because obviously we want the finest thing for all of our kids, we really do. But the one thing I just wanted to say was, because of 
the fine work that has been done on this budget was why I made this particular recommendation because I, we had presenter over after presenter and I never felt that anyone stood up there and talked about any kind of crazy expensive things that were just absolutely out of line. So, it, you know, sometimes though we do have to make sacrifices as others do, I felt like it's, you know, worthy of discussion. So just wanna throw that out there. Yeah, well, in terms of wanting the best for our kids, I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to see the brand new high school that Avon Grove built and talk about a drooling opportunity. I mean, <laughs> the way that schools can be structured nowadays and just the features that they can put in there that are so in line with how students learn, it's incredible. Um, you know, and, and, and the idea that you can really transform the student's experience of being in a building if you have the capital year over year to be able to support those programs as opportunities become available. Um, so, you know, I think right now we're focusing on transforming our library so that it is a modernized environment for the students to learn that's very much in line with, with the way that screens are much more involved than books these days. Um, we have we have opportunities if we maintain the capital and I'm a I do not approve of boards who will scrimp and save one month one year to get a zero or a, a 0.5 and then the next year have a four percent increase because I, I think that's irresponsible I think it's much more responsible to our community to stay very steady at, if possible at a you know like a two or three percent max incremental and I'm very proud of the fact that this board has been able to do that and this administration has been able to work every year to look at you know what can we control in terms of costs so that we're not expanding to a big jump at any point in time and and I do have fear that we either would be robbing ourselves of the future capabilities to improve our structures or causing a big jump in the future were we to step back this year I'd like to add to that, uh, just to kind of put things in perspective. I, I know, you know, 1.75 percent sounds like a large increase, um, but the uh, it's based on property tax and it's based on property value, and so the average property value in an ONJ Roberts right now is about a half a million dollars, and those average taxpayers, this increase will be about 110 dollars for the year. So, you know, yeah. I think that it's it's a small amount to save, you know, to put towards our future and to keep, you know, these capital things going. I'd like to make a couple comments. I appreciate the hard work and reasonable tax increase reflected in this year's budget. There's three elements that have budget implications that I would like to see addressed in the coming months. We're spending a very significant amount of money on math and ELA resources. We've acknowledged the COVID slip and the importance of bringing students back to the expected levels of performance. I'd like to see more frequent updates and reports on whether or not these measures and expenditures are effective, and I'd especially like to hear from the teachers. Second, um, has to do with equity of teaching load, and I want to emphasize I'm not talking about special education here. The concern I continually hear is the large class sizes in elementary, middle, and high school, and yet we have regular ed teachers with much, much fewer student contacts and responsibilities, and I've sent Dr. Stad a list of the teachers with these special assignments I'm referring to. Um, finally, I support the Dean of Students position at the middle school, but I believe that this addition should be a part of a school-wide climate and cultural initiative at that building that involves staff administrators and parents. And I hope the addition of the Dean is just the first step in this process. Thanks for listening. Any additional board discussion at this time? Yes, actually, I, I would like to make comments on um, the board scheduling and start time and all that because I wasn't actually here for the conversation before. Um, I often have to work until 6 p.m., so it's very, very um, difficult for me to 
guarantee that I'm going to be here on time for 6 p.m. meetings. Um, so that would not suit my schedule. I, I also don't think that it's appropriate for um, you know, many of our community members who may have similar issues trying to get here for a 6 p.m. meeting. Um, I also think that offering the, the remote comment over Zoom has been a very, very successful approach for our district. Um, I, I really appreciate a lot of the comments that we've gotten over Zoom. Um, I, I love the fact that it enables somebody to um, perk up because they hear that something's happening at a board meeting and, and perhaps join in time for a conversation or to make a comment at the end that they wouldn't have been able to do if it were only offered in person. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of continuing the Zoom and I'm not entirely sure why the decision was made to discontinue it. I have to agree with Jennifer. Uh, I think we once you open all these lines of communication, uh, it's very hard to just shut them down. And the corporate world everywhere, universities, they're all realizing that you can't just pull away all these opportunities for participation and involvement, you know, once you've had them work, as Jennifer points out. So. I agree with her there. I'll also comment because I was not here um, for this discussion and I believe Zoom should stay. I think that it's an equitable um, asset to making sure our community can be involved in our discussions. And um, I think especially since our district is so active um, and we want our students to be active and we know the driving age is until, you know, independently almost 17. We have a lot of parents in different places. We also have parents that don't have transportation available to them. We have parents that are coming to and from work. Um, and I think the ability for them to be able to tune in and comment when they want is extremely important for our district. About the Zoom, um, I just have a question as far as um, are we able to do Zoom from the middle school as um, Mrs. Culp was uh, questioning? This summer, um, because this room will be under construction, we can't physically be here. Right. Mm -hmm. So we will have to relocate to the middle school and we will be contracting with the IU this summer to provide that service for us because the capability is not in that facility at this time. Okay, so. At cost to us, we will be contracting at cost okay. to us with the IU. Yes, and so I know that that has been the concern as far as um, wanting to move the meetings to other locations and um, some people are questioning that like about microphones but the fact of the matter is when you're on zoom the people who are on zoom want to speak we have to be able to hear them all of us and everyone in the room and that's a big deal rather than just a microphone like this it's much more involved and so that's why that is the concern I'll just add a couple of comments from my perspective. And I, I have been one that has been advocating for, for moving away from the Zoom. Um, if you recall, prior to the pandemic, um, we were videotaping board meetings and then posting them at a later date. The working sessions, there was an audio recording uh, that we were using for those meetings. And what we're proposing is live streaming for, for both of those meetings so that, that folks can engage and see the work of the board. Uh, but a, a concern that I do have is with, with Zoom comments uh, and folks making them via Zoom. And that's just my, my personal feeling, that talking with my other colleagues, we're the only district uh, in Chester County that is still offering Zoom. I think it was a good accommodation that we needed to make for the pandemic, but we're beyond that now. And my thinking is I want our public to be engaged and see the work of the board so that we are transparent. But I think if you're going to make a comment about the work, you should be here in person. And again, that's my personal thinking. You know, in talking with our technology staff, there's more to supporting these Zoom conversations than, than we know of at this point. And I do want to have a workshop to share some of that uh, information with the board. We're unable to confirm who is making those comments via Zoom. Um, so again, you know, and Zoom was uh, something that we used for instruction during the pandemic. But now that we're post-pandemic, we're not using Zoom and our teachers are not advocating for it. We want kids to be present and be in school. So I'm trying to make the same uh, decision here for our district. I just think it's better for folks to make a comment to be here in person. But I want them to see the work of our board 
uh, through uh, live streaming. But again, that's my opinion. These are the board's meetings, so the format that you want will make it work, but uh, that's, that's my strong opinion moving forward. I think I have to just, I have to make a comment based on my own personal situation, having and knowing so many families that have kids that have disabilities in our district. And I can tell you from a parent with a high need child, I'm lucky that I have somebody available and I can trust that can watch my child. When you have a child that does have high needs, there are not many options out there for you. And I think that when you take away that opportunity for families who have multiple experiences in our district on multiple levels of support to not be able to contribute, I find that to be a major disadvantage for a certain population of, of people. And then we also have three Title I elementary schools, which it's a large amount of, of, of people who are, who, who are socially economically disadvantaged. And I think that that's something else we have to think about for population purposes. So I think there is, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, well, I appreciate your perspective. Um, I just like to offer you know, my opinion on that. Um, in the last 18 months, uh, the most disruptive board meetings we have had have not been based on Zoom comments, but they've actually been based on in-person disruption. So number one. Uh, number two, I see your comment about confirming whether people actually are or are not in the district. We ask them to speak just on Zoom, just like we ask them to speak in person. As far as I know, we're not doing any security checks or checking IDs and unknown people can come into the stand and say they are from a township and make a comment just as well. So I don't believe that in person provides a barrier any greater than Zoom does. Uh, and at, at least on Zoom, if someone does become inappropriate, we have the technical ability to shut them down uh, quickly by turning off the screen or their access or muting them. So I, I think, you know, although I do appreciate the in-person, I, I, I always say to, you know, uh, you know my colleagues uh, at work, you know, if you can make an in-person meeting, that should be your number one priority. Uh, but if it's uh, a choice between you know balancing or picking and choosing, and you can make it work uh, for everybody technologically, uh, that makes sense to me. So um, you know, I think that you know that's my perspective there. I I think that you know as a society we want to encourage participation in its greatest extent. You know, back when towns were very small, we would have the entire town in one in one room. And we would all get our opinions. And as towns got larger and society got larger, we went to a representative uh, type you know, system like we have here. We're all elected, we're representing the people. But now from a technological standpoint, it's we can actually have personal participation by many people. And again, I think you know, to, to move away from that is a step in, in, in the wrong direction. Thank you. So I think there's, um some room for conversation here for the board on how we're going to, to move forward to meet as many of these needs as possible. As Dr. Stout said, we are going to um, have a workshop for the board to understand what capabilities are around the district so that we can make um, a more informed decision. Okay. Um, one more scheduled? thing. I appreciate um, that. Is, I was yes. wondering if we would consider making a distinction because I'm under the impression that the only you know, and this is going back to pre-COVID, the only meetings that we ever moved around were the working sessions. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the, the voting board meetings. And I do think that it's more critical to ensure public comment is open and, and without barriers at the public board meetings than at the working sessions. Um, you know, so, so could there potentially be a compromise that we might be able to move our working sessions to some areas where it is difficult to have the Zoom um, but in those cases, we would make sure that we would advertise it as without Zoom, you know, because of the facility right. and not make it affect the, the ones that are in this building where we have the capabilities of Zoom. It, you know, like, it, I, I don't think it has to be an all or nothing. Right. And I know? certainly know that that is on the, the list of possibilities of how we can move forward, um, you know, still trying to um, prioritize the all the different needs, including the idea of 
taking opportunities to be around in the district, as you said, as we used to with the working sessions um, or committee of the whole meetings at that time um, and what uh, voting meetings could look like and they don't have to be the same. So, um, okay. Okay. Is there any other board discussion? Mrs. Kermine, do we have any old business? Uh, we do not, Mrs. Peterson. Okay. Then we, uh, sorry, I have to go back to glasses. We are going to uh, agenda item 12, approval of personal personnel matters consent items. Do I have a motion to approve personnel matters consent items 12.2 through 12.6? Um, sorry. Let me reread that, I apologize. The board, I'm looking for a motion to approve the following personnel matters, which are items 12.2 through 12.6 as action consent items subject to the proviso as presented. Do I have a motion? So moved. Mrs. DiMarino, do I have a second? Second. Dr. Rattoli, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 13.1, may I have a motion to approve out-of-state overnight student trips as presented? So moved. Mrs. Sabo, do I have a second? Second. Mrs. DiMarino, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. 13.2, approval of the appointment of law firm for construction matters. May I have a motion to for the approval? of the appointment of Saxon and Stump as legal counsel for construction matters for the period of July 1, 2023 to June 30, 2024 as presented. So moved. Mr. Harmanos, do I have a second? Second. Dr. Rattoli, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 13.3, approval of the appointment of the law firm for general legal counsel. May I have a motion to approve the appointment of Fox Rothschild LLP for general legal counsel for the period of July 1, 2023 to June 30, 2024 as presented. So moved. Mrs. Munson, do I have a second? second. Ms., uh, Mr. Harmanos, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes 13.4 approval of the appointment of law firm for real estate assessment appeals. May I have a motion for the approval of the appointment of Yergi Daler Alabach Sheffy Picardi as legal counsel for real estate assessment appeals for the period of July 1, 2023 to June 30th, 2024 as presented. So moved. Dr. Rattoli, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Chester, any discussion? I apologize for whatever names I butchered in that <laughs> list. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 13.5, the approval of the appointment of law firm for special education matters. May I have a motion for the approval of the appointment of Sweet Stevens, Katz, and Williams as legal counsel for special education for the period of July 1, 2023 to June 30th, 2024 as presented. So moved. Mrs. Munson, a second? Second. Mr. Harmanos, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 13.6, the approval of textbooks for the 2023-2024 school year. May I have a motion for the approval of textbooks for the 2023-2024 school year as presented and approved by the Curriculum and Special Education Committee at the working session on May 8, 2023. So, so moved. moved. Second. Mrs. DiMarino and Mrs. Sabo, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> the motion passes. 13.7, the approval of policies for second reading. May I have a motion to approve the policies for second reading as presented? Policy 137, policy 137.1, policy 137.2, policy 137.3, and policy 227. All motion. Mr. Doherty? Second. Mrs. Sabo? Any discussion? I, I would have Mrs. a. Munson. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It was Mrs. Munson. I apologize. So, uh, second reading. This is not the adoption. Is that correct? Correct. This is a second reading, and it would uh, move to next um, voting meeting. Correct. Right. 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 Mrs. Yeah, I think it might actually be first reading. Is it supposed to be first reading? Because we discussed them in discuss April third. But that wouldn't have been a reading. Right. First reading is the first time it comes to the board. Second reading is approval. Is this the first time it has come to a voting meeting, though? Have we only had it? It's I think it was a board, uh, a working session. A working we discussed session? it last time. 
Yep, we discussed it at work. Yeah, so, so, so we, we may need to amend this amended motion. motion. Okay, so I need a motion to amend it. Thank yeah, you, motion. David, for noticing that, because I, I, it was pinging something in the back of my head, but I think you're right. And then, and then regarding, um, I'll bring this up now just so, you know, to, I'm, I'm still, I'm still uh, not happy with the policy uh, 227. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, particularly part on the uh, second offense where we are saying for first offense uh, su student suspension would be up to seven days and then for second offense we are saying the suspension would be 10 days uh, period and I would like to you know get an amendment for up to 10 days uh, for that I don't know if anybody well if this is a first reading that. you can change it in between yeah, and, and I thought we did discuss that in the working session, and I thought we did say up to 10. I don't think we so. Changed, no, we, we changed the that. first We part. changed did the we? wording of the first part to up to seven, but, not mm -hmm. the but I don't part, know not that we gave direction to change the second mm -hmm. part to up to no. 10 no. at did, that time. Did we get any information? Because I believe, I think one of, we requested to see if it was something that was I talked with the high school administration where it came from, and they would like the, the language that is in the policy, the 10 days. They like the flexibility for the first time offense up to seven, but they, they, they would recommend that we keep the policy as is with a, with a 10 day suspension for a second offense. Um, as on a different note on that same policy, um, I was being asked about this and I did not know the answer since we spend so much time talking about the days and everything. As far as controlled substances, um, are all con things that are considered controlled substances illegal to minors or like the vape products and things like that? I just was hoping maybe we could clarify the language in that policy because I personally don't really fully understand. Um, I know it's not legal to sell nicotine to minors, correct, but I don't know about vaping where there's no nicotine involved or I'm not really sure exactly how that is yeah even that I, I did read that but if we could just take a look at that definition and make sure it's clear I'll read it again but just wanted to throw that out there that I was I was not clear about what that means exactly may especially make, as far as the 10 day thing I'm sorry may I make a clarification regarding first versus second reading the first reading actually occurred in April so we had an April working session. It went to the school board for first reading at the end of April. Okay. During May, we didn't have a quorum, so we didn't discuss anything during May. So nothing moved forward for a first Can reading. We, what was so the agenda the item reading. number in April? Because I'm looking at April's agenda, and I'm not seeing it right away. It is 7.4. 7.3. Which one are we okay. on? Okay. Okay, and that may be where the confusion is because it's in a different um, section. Um, wait, no, this isn't it, is it? Okay. So um, I, we have two options here. One is that we um, have a discussion um, now about amending this policy and what that would look like. Um, or we wait until the June 5 working session where LMP will have the floor to go over a number of policies um, and we take the opportunity between now and June 5 to perhaps put in writing some of our questions to the administration of things that we would like clarified prior to that meeting. Is that amenable? Um, I'm just thinking in terms of, yeah, I, I do remember now that Dr. Stout said on the up to 10 days not being preferred by the administration that I, I do remember thinking, well, maybe that makes sense because they don't want to be subjected to a decision at that point. They, they want to be able to tell the student and the parent a clear number mm -hmm. without, you know, feeling that they have made a, a bad error in judgment by increasing or decreasing the number of days. So I'm sympathetic to that. Um, and then the, as far as the definition of controlled substances, I believe that that is um, outside of board policy, that, that there's a legal interpretation of what controlled substances means, and therefore we don't have to define it, but I would it's, want... It would defer to the Pennsylvania Controlled Substances uh, 
Drug and Cosmetic Act. So that's the definition that would apply. Okay, so if that act so, got modified, then that would affect our policy. Yes, it would. Well, the, that, and the reason I just bring it up is I'm just looking at it now because I wasn't sure. But, you know, one of the things it says, you know, and or other health endangering compounds, which include but are not limited to, like, yep. there, there's broad, very broad language in there. And I am, I have no qualms at all with the 10-day policy at all. But I just wasn't sure if, if since that is so broad, how we know which of these substances are handled in one way. Because obviously, if someone's got heroin, it's not the same as someone has a vape pen. So, I, not that I really even know what's in that, those, but <laughs> I guess I need to study a little bit. But anyway, so maybe I just need a little more education on that so that I can fully understand what we're talking about you know, versus some of these very dangerous things and something like if a kid has nicot like cigarettes in the car, what right. is that the same, you know? Well, and there's also a difference um, in controlled substance for under 18 and over 18 or under 21 and over yeah. 21. So yeah, how the, the right. law- So if we wanna continue discussing just 227, we could probably still amend our approval to impact only policies 137, 137.1.2 and .3. Correct. You could amend the motion for the to limit the approval to the second reading of those policies, and they would be adopted through the by means of the second reading. So you're pulling out controlled substances and powering out. Uh, okay. So out. am I free to make that proposal, or does it have to come from the person who's? Did, Typically, did we, the, we had. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if we do it here, but a lot of school, uh, school boards have a friendly amendment process where the person who made the motion and seconded the motion, if they are in agreement to that amendment, you do it by friendly amendment, amendment and, and then you uh, vote on it. So if Mr. Doherty and Ms. Munson were in agreement with that amendment, that revised amend, uh, motion would be before the board. Right, so we're just pulling out 227. Everybody correct. else going forward, mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. So That's correct. I agree. Okay, so the amended motion is before the board by friendly amendment. Okay. I'd, I'd just like to add to my comment just to kind of get it out there so you can think about this for the next meeting. But uh, the, the problem I have with the hard 10 days is uh, I think that's an unequitable punishment. Um, you know, I think. Our job as a board and as a school district is to educate students. And by suspending a student for 10 days, uh, you're basically withholding their education from them. And there are students that can self-study for 10 days and not fall that far behind and keep up. There are other students that are not able to self-study in that same capacity. And so I find that that 10-day suspension is not going to hit everybody at the same level of punishment. And so that's why I'm asking for some flexibility there uh, based on, you know, learning and education and the students own standing academically. So I would ask the board, um, since this is going to go back to working session on June 5, if you have any um, questions or any requests for information that would help you uh, better inform your decision, especially if it um, uh, requires uh, um, some sort of um, research on behalf of, you know, if you're asking for a specific number or, or number of children involved or any sort of uh, information that will help you move forward, um, please ask that prior to the June 5 meeting. Um, and I am confident it can be um, given to us at that time so we can all hear it. Um, but this way, we uh, have what we need in the room to keep the conversation going. Good? Okay. So, we have we to, vote to vote on the amended motion. You're voting on the amended motion, yes. Okay. Um, so, any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 13.8, ratification of homebound instruction. Uh, may I have a motion for the ratification of homebound instruction as presented? So moved. Mrs. DiMarino, do I have a second? Second. Dr. Rattoli, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
The motion passes. 13.9, approval of a memorandum of understanding between the Crime Victim Center of Chester County Incorporated and ONJ Roberts School District. May I have a motion for the approval of a memorandum of understanding between the Crime Victim Center of Chester County Incorporated and ONJ Roberts School District as presented? So moved. Mrs. Second. Sabin, Dr. Rotoli, all in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry, any discussion? I apologize. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 13.10, approval of regulation 308D, work year and fringe benefits, confidential employees, salary determination, management evaluation, compensation. May I have an approve, a motion for the approval of confidential employees, work year and fringe benefits, salary determination and management evaluation and compensation plan as presented? So moved. Dr. Atoli, a second. Any discussion? I had a question about this. Um, I, is this something that comes through the personnel co uh, committee? I, you know, we always talk about contracts and things like that, and I, we never really discussed this. These are regulations. So I was just wondering, uh, I see nods, it comes through the personnel committee. So if the board had ever wanted to alter these, what would be the process to do so? Because I don't know that we ever discussed any of them. Not, I'm not advocating to do that. I just, am, I'm, I just don't understand the process here. So, um, sorry, I, I'm on the wrong agenda now. I went back to April at one point. Um, so, uh, because this is uh, involves um, employees, it is done um, within the personnel committee, um, and it involves um, employee. Um, um, uh, employment. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, uh, and, and having it on the agenda open to the board is an opportunity for the board to review and ask any questions that they may have. So if we were, were not comfortable with whatever this would be, would this be the time that we would discuss it? Would be this meeting or this, these would be, uh, since these personnel matters, would it have to be in an executive session or how would that no, it, it's it, because it's a general compensation plan and not applicable to any uh, individual employee, it would be appropriate for discussion in a public meeting. And the reason it's a plan is because this is not a uh, unionized workforce. These are non-union workers. And I did not review, is this a one-year plan or a multi-year plan? So it would, it w and once approved then, it would be remain in effect for the term of the plan. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, there is also times where we have had addendums or changes to um, uh, a standing. You could, you would have the option of amending the plan in the future. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to get information on that. And, and to be a, a little more clear, this is for, um, our confidential secretaries who are not part of our Teamsters um, and not covered by our Teamsters agreement and they're not covered by the Act 93 agreement and they are not covered by our REA agreement. Right. So this is a pocket, a small number of employees that um, encompass our, our, generally are our confidential secretaries and administrative assistants. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'm sorry, did I ask for a motion on this already? Not yet. Oh, sure. I thought you did. Oh. Dr. Rotoli, okay, first and second, and this was discussion. Thank you, sorry. Um, any additional discussion? It's been a long day. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 1311, the approval of Teamsters Memorandum of Understanding. Do I have a motion for the approval of the Teamsters Memorandum of Understanding as presented? So moved. So moved. Second. Mrs. DiMarino and Mr. Harmanos, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. 1312, the approval to establish a student activity club. May I have a motion to uh, establish a student activity club in accordance with the provisions of section 511 of the Pennsylvania School Code and School Board Regulation 122A and or 122B as presented. This approval also provides for the establishment of accounts within the student activity accounting system when available. And the uh, the club is a high school level club for the orchestra. Do I have a motion? So moved. Mrs. Sabo, do I have a second? Second. Mrs. DiMarino, any discussion? I thought we had an orchestra. We have an orchestra, but we don't have um, a student club to support the orchestra. 
So the orchestra is a class, um, but this would allow the students to have it as an activity as well. Okay, thank you. I'm yes. And to have a, a student that, account for it. Would, right. would students um, be required to be in the class to be in the club? I don't think so. No. Or my intention would be that it wouldn't. Because otherwise, there'd have to be some sort of out of school meetings or something. Just wondering. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer that, that, to that. Yeah, that, that's a good question. question. <laughs> I, I would imagine that only students in our <laughs> chorus would want to be in the, in the club. Orchestra. Orchestra. But, yeah or orchestra uh, would want to be in the club, but I, I'd have to look at their, at their bylaws. You, you could be in the Latin club, but not be taking Latin. So, mm -hmm. okay. you support yeah, I don't think we would exclude those students if right. they wanted to be in. Okay. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 1313, the approval of award for request for proposals for food service management company. May I have a motion for the approval of the award for request for proposals for food service management company as presented? Come on, guys. So moved. Mrs. DiMarino, is there a second? Second. Dr. Rotoli, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. 13.14, approval of receipt of proposed tax resolution for the 2023-24 fiscal year. May I have a motion for the approval of receipt of proposed tax resolution for the 2023-2020 fiscal year as presented? So moved. Mr. Harmanos, do I have a second? Second. I'm sorry, was that Mrs. Sabo or Mrs. Munson? That was Munson. Munson, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion passes. 13.15, approval of proposed 2023 governmental and proprietary funds budget. May I have a motion for the approval of the proposed 2023-2024 governmental proprietary funds budget as presented? So moved. Mr. Hamanos, do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Dougherty, any discussion? I just want to say one more time that my no votes on these have, do not reflect anything on Mrs. Crumrine and her fine work. It's just some ideological issues with the way we're handling our funds. Um, you know, I'd like to, to reiterate again my, my thanks to Mrs. Kermine and, and the staff. Um, and I also um, would very much like to thank the members of the committee who served on, um, on the Finance Committee through this process, Mr. Harmanos, Mr. Doherty, Mr. Uh, Dr. Malmazak, and Mrs. DiMarino. Um, as Mr. Harmanos uh, alluded to or spoke about earlier, we held um, an unprecedented amount of public meetings about the budget process this year. Uh, as Mr. Hamano said, we had six working sessions in which we talked about the budget process. We had three standalone budget meetings. We had voting meetings that uh, at any point in time, uh, a member of the community could have come to the mic and spoken about it. And during the budget season, we actually had two town halls with had uh, 30 or 40 people in attendance each time. So I um, am proud of um, everyone in this process's uh, um, willingness to engage with the public and make sure that throughout the process, the public was um, given the opportunity to be well informed and given the opportunity to provide us with feedback and um, suggestions and opinions moving forward. Uh, and I think we were able to, uh, uh, we, we certainly listened to and were able to incorporate and hopefully um, they, the public can see uh, their input uh, in this final product. Um, again, I don't think I can um, state strongly enough that I think um, yes vote um, through this process is the economically responsible thing for the long-term um, benefit of our community. So I would add that I think it's a budget that continually reflects that we're always trying to provide more and more opportunities to students. That groups come before us uh, that questions are raised about well, could we add these classes, could we add the staff or whatever. So it's a budget that says yes to opportunity, which is, I think, a wonderful thing. Uh, and it also says yes to continuing to provide the uh, quality teaching staff and support staff in this district. It allows us to um, continue to 
uh, invest in making sure we have the right talent in our buildings and supporting our students and positions us as competitive employers um, moving forward. And um, we are nothing without the people in these buildings. And that is important as we move forward as well. I also want to add, I think, um, I think it shows to with some of the, the new um, positions, um, though we couldn't add, I know, as many as some would have hoped, especially with some of the learning loss, um, it was not, uh, not it, it was discussed and, you know, you have to, you have to make cuts in some places, but the positions that were added I think um, help support our students' mental health, which is the number one crisis in America right now. And I think that that is reflective. And then we also added some positions that help support our students in multiple tiers that we have within our buildings. Um, so I, I think this budget's a, a great and responsible budget. Okay, any additional discussion? Okay. Mrs. Carmine, do we have to take a roll call or are we good going? Not that I'm aware of. I know we need a two thirds vote in order for the budget to okay. pass. Okay, let's go. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion passes. Thirteen sixteen approval of 2023 Homestead and Farmstead Exclusion Resolution. May I have a motion for the approval of the 2023 Homestead and Farmstead Exclusion Resolution as presented? So moved. Mrs. Munson. Second. Mr. Harmanos, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 1317, the approval of appointment, bond coverage, and facsimile signature for board treasurer. May I have... A motion for the approval of appointment bond coverage and facsimile signature for board treasurer as presented. So moved. Mrs. DiMarino, a second? I'll second. Mr. Doherty, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 1318. Approval of a resolution establishing tax collector, sorry, tax collector compensation procedures and rules. May I have a motion to approve a, re a resolution establishing tax collector compensation procedures and rules as presented? So moved. Mr. Harmanos, do I have a second? Second. Mrs. Sabo, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 1319 approval of annual filing of board officer signature per facsimile signature act. May I have a motion for the approval for approval to be granted for signatures of the school board president, secretary, and treasurer who are involved with instruments of payment of public securities be filed with the secretary of the commonwealth as per the uniform facsimile signature of public officials act of July 25, 1961, PL 849, as amended PS section 302 et sequitur. Let's see. Let's see. I got really close. Sorry. Do I have the motion? <laughs> Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Mrs. Second. Dean Marino, is there a second? Second. Mrs. Sabo, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 13.20, approval to authorize the school board treasurer's signature and facsimile signature. Approval to authorize the school board's treasurer's signature and may I have a motion for the approval to authorize the school board's treasurer's signature and facsimile signature for district payroll and bank accounts. So moved. Mrs. DiMarino, does there second. A second? Mrs. Sabo, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. 13.21. Approval of banks as depositories for school funds for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. May I have a motion for the approval of banks as depositories of school funds for the 2023-24 fiscal year as presented? So moved. Mrs. DiMarino, Mr. Hermanos, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 13.22, authorization for employees to act as agents in signing vouchers and checks. May I have a motion for the authorization for employees to act as agents in signing, check, signing vouchers and checks for the 2023-24 fiscal year as presented? So moved. Mrs. DiMarino, Mrs. Sabo, any discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 13.23, approval of construction change orders. I may have a motion for the approval of construction change orders for the security and stadium upgrade project and the district service center project as presented. So moved. Mr. Harmonis, a second. Right. Dr. Rattoli, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 13.24, approval of ratification of professional services maintenance agreement. May I have a motion for the approval or ratification of professional services maintenance agreement as presented? Mr. Chester, do I have a second? second. Dr. Rattoli, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Congratulations, guys. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. They're waiting to talk. <laughs> okay. We are on agenda item 14, public comment. I'll put the glasses back. Sorry. Information proposals and statements from individuals or delegations pertaining to any item. Speakers are to indicate your name and township of residence. Speakers will be limited to not more than three minutes. Please understand that this is not a time for dialogue with the board. Rather, the board will listen to all comments and consider them in future deliberations. Also, if you have a question for the school board, please email all board of school directors at school board members at ojrsd.net and you will receive a written response. For anyone online who would like to make a comment, please use the raise hand function. When it is your turn to speak, please state your name and township of residence. Good evening. Before I begin, I think you guys name and really. Oh, yeah, I'm Bechevel Fuller East Damiel. You do so much, and I'm watching this long, long meeting. I don't know how you don't have a hoarse voice already, but it was, it's really very impressive. And I haven't been coming. I've been on Zoom, which is what I want to talk about, and I heard others talk about that. Um, even if other districts don't do it, that doesn't mean that we have to follow suit. I could not come to several meetings. I had surgery. I couldn't see at night. I was a mess. Then there was a death in my family. I wasn't comfortable coming out in public. I needed to Zoom. And I was able to do that. And that way, if I wanted to say something, I could. And that's what I really think is important. Meetings that start at 6 o'clock, I'm retired. I can be there. But a lot of people can't. And I think your points were well taken that if we have things start at six o'clock, people are just getting home, people are so busy, they're feeding their kids, et cetera. And if you watch it, it's different than watching it with the intent to perhaps speak, and through Zoom, we can speak. So those of you who um, spoke for Zoom, I, I totally agree with you. And I do Zoom to teach someone in Colombia, and it works great. And I have classes where there are 20 or 30 of us, it works great. I don't understand why we can't set that up here. Okay, so that was my first thing. Second thing, school board members, I'm on my phone right now because I wrote this out on a Google Doc so I can read this. When you are on your phones as school board members, I wonder sometimes, are you not paying attention looking at your phone? As our representatives, it's important that you pay attention and that you speak for yourselves. And my concern is if you are on your phone is somebody who is like me sitting in the audience, feeding you a question and then you ask a question and you can ask it at the inappropriate time because it's really coming from someone in the audience. So it's just something that I wonder when I see people on their phones. Are you coming up with the questions yourselves? Are you being fed them by somebody else? Those people who might be feeding you the questions should wait till it's their turn. That's all. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Ken Hunt, and I am the high school girls volleyball coach. I am not a resident. I'm, I'm a school employee. Uh, we are here tonight in support of adding a girls middle school volleyball program per the National Federation of High School Sports survey from October 10, 2022. Volleyball continues to rise in popularity among girls sports and was the only top 10 sport to register an increase from the three years ago. We have 454,000 plus participants. Volleyball is only 2,500 participants behind track and field for the number one 
sport for girls. This past season, I had 101 girls signed up for high school tryouts and our off-season middle school clinics. 55 of those students were from seventh and eighth grade. Nine of the 12 PAC schools have middle school programs. The three school programs without are Pottstown, they just added their high school program, and Boyertown and Upper Perk. Um, I know volleyball is probably the costlier option because of the renovations to the middle school gym, but with the numbers that I'm seeing from the, from the girls' participation, I think it's hands down should be the sport we choose. And thank you ladies for toughing it out and staying. Um, they were giving me side eye looks, but I appreciate you guys coming out for your team. Um, some of them would like to speak. Thank you. I admire their endurance already. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Ava Needham. I'm a senior and I'm about to graduate from OJR. So I have played volleyball my four years in high school, and it has been so influential to me. Uh, the first thing, uh, I have two main reasons why I think we should establish a middle school team. The first reason is being the sheer interest in volleyball. Uh, as Coach Ken mentioned, volleyball is the second most popular sport behind track. And last year, we had a record-breaking amount of girls try out. Many of them were inexperienced and had never played volleyball before, like I was when I first started. and. I think that it would help girls stay active and not fall trapped to being on their phones and just sitting inside all day. But it would also help them improve their skills for when they come into high school, only bettering our own high school team. And it would also help because we wouldn't have to spend as much time in the initial parts of the season going over how to play volleyball and the basics. We could fo focus more on strategy and building the team. Um, the second reason is that volleyball is so much more than a sport. Volleyball is a place where kids can go after school to take their mind off the stresses, stressors that school brings or just life in general. And I have met so many of my best friends playing volleyball, so who wouldn't want to extend that privilege out to middle schoolers to help them and give them this opportunity to play volleyball and meet new friends? Because making, meeting friends in high school is hard. We've all gone through it. and. So this, starting them early, would give them great opportunities to form new relationships and also better their volleyball skills. We have the motivation, we have the resources, and we have the support. So I very strongly encourage you guys to establish a middle school program. Thank you. Charlotte Wilkes. Um, I'm a current junior at the high school. $15 for the membership for your middle school daughter to play on a club team an additional $55 so that she can try out. Now she made the team, she's super excited. Do you have an additional $3,700 to spare so that she can play? That figure doesn't even include the expenses for traveling, attending her games, not to mention the $50 tournament shirt that she wants after she gets gold. That is an unreasonable ask for many of our O and J families. Why is it important to play club? Well, our freshmen, are coming in and have only touched a volleyball in gym class or maybe at the beach, and most of them don't make the cut. Many of the freshmen, including myself, come in without the basic knowledge of the sport. This gives us two weeks between tryouts and the season to teach the girls two, we two years worth of skills. Um, since the team began, we have progressed every year, but we've come to a point where it's difficult to compete with the schools that have a two-year advantage over us. Like Ken said, nine of the 12 teams that we compete against have a middle school program. All of these schools have, are very competitive. Um, not only this, but volleyball is a gateway to a higher education. Consider this, there are 1,069 collegiate women's volleyball teams over divisions one, two, and three. To put this into perspective, there are only 528 collegiate women's lacrosse teams. As the board, you know that our mission here at ONJ is to inspire success today and greatness tomorrow. We owe that to our middle school girls. Thank you for your time. Hi, uh, my name is Melinda Jordan and I'm a sophomore at the Owen J. Roberts High School. Um, this is a little bit about my journey um, getting cut my freshman year. And I became very interested in volleyball um, when I was in eighth grade and me and my parents um, tried to look into getting involved with volleyball and unfortunately there was no middle school program obviously and we had a hard time um, getting involved so i practiced a lot at home and i 
took a few lessons at the 422 Sports Complex. Um, unfortunately, I did not gain a lot out of that. So going into uh, my freshman year, I didn't really have a lot of experience playing volleyball at all. And I lacked basic fundamentals that I should have had in my middle school time. So I got cut my freshman year and um, I didn't really know, um, I didn't really know like club seasons, I didn't really know about that. So by the end of the freshman season, um, I was too late for club tryouts, so I did not get to play for off season for my freshman year. Going to my sophomore year, however, I made the team fortunately for JV and I played club. But my experience was um, we didn't really have coaches to guide us with clubs because we, we didn't have a middle school program. And I believe that if there was a middle school program, I would have had time for learning experience, the basic um, necessities I would need to go into the volleyball season for high school. I would have had more um, time, obviously, and I would have been more experienced than I am now. So I believe that I was a little set back because there was no middle school programs and many other girls could agree with me because many girls were cut their freshman year as well, just like me. Um, but um, this is me in support of a middle school program and my experience without it. So thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Adriana and I'm a freshman currently here. I've always took an interest in volleyball and not having a middle school team affected me because it resulted in lost potential I could have possibly constructed for Coach Ken for the start of my freshman year in the 2022 season. So that resulted in me getting cut along like Malin was for her freshman year. I think this is very important for the girls who want to pursue volleyball and they can start young to create a successful program for their high school career. A girls volley middle school volleyball program is just as important as the boys middle school football, baseball, basketball program, etc. Additionally, students have proven that kids who play, additionally studies have shown that kids who play sports do significantly better academically than the typical student due to the fact that they hold determination to stay eligible and capable to play for their sport. Pursuing a sport for your school builds character in a student, discipline, integrity, and leadership, not only benefiting for themselves as a student, but ONJ Roberts as a whole. So adding a middle school's girls volleyball program would benefit young girls to start early for their high school career. Thank you for your time. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Emery Hamadis in West Vincent Township. I'm a freshman on the high school volleyball team, um, and I would like to suggest a middle school volleyball team as well. I'm gonna speak uh, a bit about my story. Uh, when I became a freshman, I wanted to join uh, the volleyball team, but I had no experience, except in gym class, which is completely different. Um, tryouts were intimidating because of the amount of girls who wanted to play, but have never played before. Our team was constructed more off of athletic capability and quickness to pick up the game, which is good, but it could be more fair and better. Uh, when I got on the team, it was hard to catch up to athletes my age in other schools because of their history playing volleyball. Uh, our team worked really hard, but we really got the reward because of our lack of rules and court awareness. The community on the volleyball team is strong and made me more comfortable for the transition to high school. I think a middle school volleyball team would further engage students who want to play volleyball, as well as make our team one of the greats. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Jordan. Um, I'm over, I live over here in South Coventry and um, Melinda's my daughter. <laughs> She's hiding. Um, I've had the privilege of watching this volleyball program this last year and uh, seeing what it looks like when they become winners and um, watching um, Melinda in her first year get cut because she didn't have enough experience was 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 tough but at the same time had she had a little bit more experience um, I think she she probably would have made the, the team the first year but there's we're missing out on a lot of girls just not getting the opportunity to develop themselves in volleyball. And the leadership skills that I see on and off the court from it have been amazing. And it takes um, years to develop 
a good program and, and develop those players to the level of the competition that they have to play in. And uh, to see them strive and win and become leaders um, has been amazing. So um, thank you for your time and, and hope to see a middle school volleyball program. Heather McCurry, East Coventry. I think these guys need to be on mock trial team next year. Um, I just, so I think the more activities that this district can provide for these kids, the better, but I, I really actually think you're in trouble when you say we gotta stop the Zoom because everybody else doesn't do it because pay to play, and it's not to penalize these guys, it's to bring more revenue into the district so that you can have more activities. And also, I don't understand, like, I don't understand why these sports teams, these kids are coming to literally beg for you guys to put in new teams when there is an athletic director who gets paid a lot of money, an assistant athletic director who is also paid that should be reviewing and having meetings and coming and talking about what are the modern trends. Because the volleyball thing is not new. Girls soccer and the glut of players on there is not new. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, there's no ninth grade girls lacrosse team anymore even though the boys want a lacrosse team. And then there's the whole wrestling issue, which is already being advertised in Pottstown for coaches. So we are behind here at ONJ, right? You guys voted on a budget tonight and none of those things were in there. You guys talked about fiduciary duty to save money, but you guys also don't have the programs that are like the modern programs here for everybody. And um, I just want to I just want to say I was at Daniel Boone awards ceremony for the seniors the other night president of Kiwanis and I got to hear how Daniel Boone's graduating class had more um, college credits and more early admittance than any year ever before in Daniel Boone history, but also in the entirety of Berks County. So I wish you guys would also focus on the academics too. But this is this is kind of embarrassing to hear about these sports teams that we don't have because we should really have them. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brooks Rowland from Warwick Township. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, policy 227, the controlled substance and paraphernalia. Um, you know, I read through that, and I think we do have to have a policy in place. I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we see across our community countrywide, whether it's the fentanyl crisis, uh, we see some, some just some of these crazy drugs called Trank in Philadelphia, and we don't want to see these coming into our community. I do have some concerns, though, as I read through this entire policy. There's only one line about parents and notifying parents, and that's when students are required to have medical attention. So my question to the board as you go back and you take another look at this policy is where are the parents' involvement if your child has been identified as having a drug or a substance abuse? You know, I see referrals to the student assistance program. I see that non-compliance is if students don't follow the recommendations of the student's assistance program. Nowhere in there do you talk about building and working with parents. If there was an allegation against my child that they were using narcotics or something like that, I would expect, unless it's a life-threatening call, to be the first call for you to make. I know my child better than anybody in the room. I know him better than any administrator. So I ask as the board goes back and as the group goes back to rewrite this policy, take the parents into consideration. They're the ones providing that home environment. I understand not all home environments are great, but let's give the parents the opportunity to step up and do the responsibility and take charge of their, of their children and their children's well-being. Um, I did mention briefly about the uncooperative behavior. I find that um, a lot of parents might choose not to follow the SAP program. They might want to go with a private program or something like that. And so I find it um, almost a little bit overstepping by saying if they don't follow the recommendations that that's considered uncooperative behavior, I think that's a little far reaching. I am prior law enforcement, so I do understand a significant dif difference between reasonable suspicion and probable cause. Underneath the testing uh, portion of it, you state, and I'm just gonna read it from here, the student may be required to submit to a drug or alcohol testing. The testing may include, but not limited to analysis of bodily fluids, blood, urine, saliva, saliva or the administration of a breathalyzer. 
and that's based on reasonable suspicion. I'll tell you from law enforcement, if we did it on reasonable suspicion, you couldn't force somebody to do something. I pulled somebody over for a DWI, I would offer it to them. If they refused it, I had to get a warrant. In order for your warrant to get signed off, you had to have probable cause. I do have concerns that if you do follow this, unless there is a state statute or something that you're leveraging to take this under reasonable suspicion, you should include that. If not, you could run into possible violations of the Fourth Amendment. Um, additionally in here, it doesn't mention anything about contacting parents before you're testing their child. And you could be talking about children as young as 14 or 15. So I just wanted to bring some of these concerns to everybody here. Um, but the biggest one I have in here is the lack of parental engagement Thank in this you whole for process. Your comment. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, David Morrison from North Coventry. Uh, I told Dr. Stout, there's going to be a microphone here, I'm probably going to talk. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the board. We moved to this uh, district two years ago. My daughter Reagan was uh, recognized tonight for two, uh, two band things, uh, the indoor drum line and for district band. Of course, she's been trying to get a summer job and tonight was the first night she had to work. Otherwise, she'd have to be there, be, she'd be here. So I just wanted to say thank you, um, not only for the opportunity she's had, she's had a great two years here in the O and J school district, but my background, I, I, even though I don't, uh, I'm not a teacher now. I have 10 years of music teaching experience with a bachelor's degree and master's degree in music education. So I'm a strong advocate and supporter of the arts. And to have the programs we have now, they need time to develop, they need funding. Thank you for giving them both of those things uh, throughout all the schools. And they also need a great, have, have a great uh, culture. And that is developed by the leaders that you have in place, whether it's uh, Mr. Mengel uh, or uh, Mr. Herbine, who was here tonight. Uh, I just, uh, I'm really appreciative and proud of the district. So thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Mark DeFusco, the president of the Roberts Education Association. I just wanted to come up and say thank you to everybody for all the wonderful treatment that they gave all the teachers during Teacher Appreciation Week from the statement the board had in your meeting last month to all the nice notes we've got from parents and students and especially the wonderful ladies you honored earlier, the heads of the PTO and the PTAs and the, uh, the PTSA as well. So just wanna say thanks to the community. And we have a hand raised. Christine uh, McAfee, can you unmute and uh, please state your full name and township of residence. Christine, you're unmuted. Um, Mrs. McAfee, if you can hear me, please write to the school board, um, whatever you were hoping to say, and we'd be happy to read it and get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item 15, board discussion follow-up and request for information. Does the board have any discussion follow-up and request for information other than what we have already asked uh, in the course of this meeting? I, this may be oh. a stupid question. <laughs> has to do with volleyball. I, I guess there's a certain number of players on the court, but um, would we be able to add more players to the team or an additional team or something if we had more qualified freshmen because they were, they kept on focusing on you know being cut as a freshman which i'm sure feels very hurtful but would we actually be able to have more people on the team if we had a middle school program That's a good question, and we'll talk about that uh, at our work session. We'll have Dr. Cuthbert here to talk about some of the proposals that we've had to add new teams, and uh, we'll have some administrative recommendations. Um, to to um, continue off of that, um, I encourage um, you all who can be here on June 5 to be here and part of that conversation. Um, and. Uh, I'm going to go against a little bit of our own policy about uh, not engaging with a public comment, but um, as uh, a mom to, to kids your own ages, I appreciate um, your willingness to come here tonight to sit through um, 
more than two hours of uh, our business meeting uh, to hear your voices heard. And um, I know we all appreciate your willingness to come up and speak on behalf of something that is important to you in this district. So thank you. Um, I'd just like to second that, that um, you know, you're, 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 you're participating in a democratic process on like the basic level and that's really important. And this is a board that wants to listen to its students. So, you know, think about that for other things besides volleyball moving forward in your academic career, but good job. And they also are advocating for something that doesn't really affect them. They've already been through middle school. And so that's also very commendable. Um, I had another, just a comment I wanted to make real quick about um, the 6 p.m. You know, we're, we're going to discuss this in the future, but um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, there's no way to accommodate everyone's different scheduling. And so as many people as maybe don't like a move to 6 p.m., other people, that will be easier for them because they'll be before maybe they're putting their kids to bed or something like that. So I feel like we need to, we can talk about it, but I just wanted to put that out there. Um, also, you know, when we start meetings this late, you know, it does get late and that so we're all volunteers here and sometimes we just have our own things that we need, want to consider. And finally, as far as the cell phone use, you know, I'm literally texting my daughter, making sure she gets home okay while, you know, she was not here tonight to be recognized because she was playing piano for the middle school concert. And so I'm looking at her and she's making sure she's okay. So apologize for any of that, but you know, please remember that we are volunteers and we have our own families and things and we do the best we can. And I don't like to miss a thing, um, but you know, I do have people that I'm responsible for. So just want to throw that out I had out a there. quick question. I have, since we're going to be discussing policy 227 uh, and the procedures that come out of that, I, I would hope that the first contact that an administrator makes is to the child's parents. So I hope that's indicated as well. Yes, before we would do any discipline, particularly a suspension, as you're talking about in that policy, there would be a phone conversation with the parents. Yep. I, I have two requests for additional information from the administration. Um, one re kind of related to uh, policy 227, but also on a broader uh, discipline basis. I know we've talked about discipline in the middle school and in the high school, and you know we've had a lot of you know kind of discipline issues kind of running through the district. Um, and I just like some information on the effectiveness of the discipline policies that we're using, and if there is room for uh, some restorative justice type practices where we're not just you know hammering on kids for doing the wrong thing, but we're actually teaching them and then following up with them you know, through this discipline process to see if they are, you know, learning from that process. You know, are there other opportunities for, you know, punishment that are more um, constructive, like community service or, or something like that? I, I know that, you know, a suspension or, or, or a detention is an easy thing. You stick a kid, bunch of kids in a room and it doesn't take a lot to administer. Uh, but, you know, are we really teaching them the right thing doing that? And, you know, can we, you know, get them out in the community and, you know, instead of just sitting there wasting, you know, stealing oxygen from the room, can we get them to do something valuable with that time? So I just like the administration to kind of maybe put some thoughts together and, you know, maybe pull some research or, or something and see if we can kind of move in that direction. Uh, my second request is, uh, and we haven't talked about this at all tonight, so something completely different is uh, there's a lot of uh, conversation, um, you know, uh, in, in the world, in the country right now about uh, AI and the effects of that. I know some of our students are, are using it at different uh, levels uh, for their schoolwork. I know there's some controversy about it as if you know, students are using AI to write a term paper, are they really learning? And um, I just like to see some policy or so the beginning of some policy drafted on the use of these technologies. I, I don't wanna see our district fall behind or our students be confused about, you know, what's appropriate use. And so maybe if we can, you know, have a board workshop on maybe best practices or something of that nature. Um, you know, I think there are there are camps where people are they say this is the you know the end of the world and the end of education as we know it. Uh, but then there's also opportunities to learn from these technologies where we can leverage these technologies to, you know, be exposed to more things and, and, and look at more data, more, more resources at a time. So, uh, you know, I'm not really 
pushing for it one way or the other, but I think that I'd like to see our district kind of, you know, take a leadership role in this and not wait for, you know, students to be confused or something to happen. David, when you say policy, do you mean something that would come in front of LNP and be voted on by the board? Or are you just talking about something more informal? I, I think at this point, it would be informal. I, I, I okay. think, I don't want to see a situation where, um, you know, we have some teachers that are like, no, you can never use this thing. And we have other teachers that are like, yeah, use it, you know, do whatever you want with it. And then some teachers are middle ground. Uh, and maybe it's leveled, like maybe there's different guidance at the elementary school level versus the middle school versus the high school level. But uh, um, I, I think if we have, you know, eight or nine different practices, then that's confusing to the students. So I'd like to see some homologous best practices, maybe. I think my concern I'm, is. I'm speaking as, on a very broad. You right, know, exactly. And yeah. it's so new to everyone in the educational community that, I mean, currently I'm thinking that we need to allow some of that experimentation to happen. That if a teacher really wants to utilize AI, we should not crack down on them. And if a teacher absolutely wants to make it their policy that for you know, a specific class, no student should be relying on AI we should enable that approach as well. So, you know, my concern about making board policies is that they do have legal implications. And so until we fully understand how AI usage is being interpreted legally throughout the community, not just within our school district, I, I'm a little bit leery of making an official board policy. Well, maybe not policy, maybe guidelines or best practices then. And, and it may, you know, I, I, it's a, uh, it's a very dynamic thing, so I don't think we, you know, whatever we decide to say, you know, in September of 2023, you know, might be something different in November of 2023. Right. You know, because it's a very fluid state and the, and the technology is changing weekly. So, but I, I think, I think if we don't have some guidance or some best practices, it, it you know, can kind of get out of, hand at some point, or, or at least cause confusion amongst the staff and the students. Board policy is meant to be slow. <laughs> right, and I, I think that this, part of the intention of this is, rather than looking at it as a board policy, is to make sure that we as an educational community are all using the same terms, that we are all aware of what the options are, and um, you know, what can we do as leaders of this community to help that process and, and make sure, as David said, that we are on um, the forefront of it and not reactionary. Yeah, we are having, because there are, there are no policies right now. I, I think I was introduced to Chat GTP, I think in February, and introduced it to our team. And now our teachers are having some conversations, but we're really at the infancy. Uh, but we are having those conversations. Um, you know, moving forward. So uh, we'll continue to do that, but I, I think it's it, it's a good idea to, to keep looking at it because uh, Chat GTP is just the beginning. There are a lot of other companies that are that are exploring it. So we're we're going to have to have some common language, and I know our teachers are already having those discussions. With it's here. So how are we going to deal with it? I I have a request for follow-up. Um, now that we're approaching the end of the school year, um, I haven't heard us talk much about our goals for this past year. I know we did a mid-year check-in, but are we planning on doing a, a final review of how we, um, how well we achieved our goals, or at least uh, do an evaluation of how satisfied we are with the goals that we set forth for this year? Yes, if the board wants that, I mean, obviously we're gathering that information right now uh, that we'll be uh, using as part of my evaluation. Um, but if we want, if we want a public presentation of those final goals, we can set a date and do that. Well, I personally would like one. I don't know how everybody else feels. I'm, I'm a big believer in goals are only uh, worthwhile if we we review them and see how we do. Okay, anything else? Okay, agenda item 16, adjournment. The meeting is officially adjourned, thank you.